It's no secret that writing can be lonely work, but does it really have to be? Whether you're full-time, part-time, or just starting out, you'll get insights into the tricks, tips, and production habits of writers from every level of the biz. From best-selling authors to those launching their first novels, you're sure to be in the company of friends as we encourage great writers to divulge and share their secrets. This is The Great Writer Share Podcast with your host, best-selling author, Daniel Wilcox. Hello and welcome to the Great Writer Share podcast with me, Daniel Wilcox, where every week I hijack an hour or so of time from some of the kindest and hardest working writers around today to join me on the show and discuss everything that makes them tick, raw and bounce. Today's date as of recording is the 16th of March and I'm going to do something a little unusual for this intro and basically I'm just going to not talk as much <laughs> because I I have a very long interview in comparison with some of the other interviews I've had and that's because the guy that I spoke to this week was incredibly fascinating, interesting and selfishly is someone that I wanted to talk to for a, a long while and uh, that guest is the one and only Jonathan Jans. Um, I give a full background as we go into the interview but Jonathan Jans is a, a writer of horror he has written such classics as Wolfland, uh, Siren and the Spectre and many more. Um, and he, I, I came across him, I actually can't remember how I came across his work, but I'm very glad I did. And I was bought one of his books last year, instantly fell in love with his writing style. Um, and then in booking him for this interview was massively surprised when I listened to a few other podcasts and did some research about him, that he's just a generally genuine guy. Um, and if you are in the business of getting amped and you love mindset and you like craft and you like networking and membership, then this interview is definitely for you. So I'll say no more as I'll let Jonathan say everything that he wants to say in a little bit. Um, but before that, let's do a little bit of house cleaning. <clears throat> but before that, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I want to do a quick shout out to Patreon. So if you want to support the show for as little as $1 a month, you can do so over at patreon.com forward slash great writers share. There you can get early access to episodes without ads and you can also ask guests any questions that you have on your mind. You also answer the question of the week and you get priority shout outs on pretty much all parts of the show. So it's definitely worth jumping over and checking it out. And speaking of question of the week, last week's question was, are you fiercely indie, hybrid or determined to go the traditional route? Tell me why. Um, that's definitely a, is that a boy's own song? Five. I don't know. <laughs> Either way. Uh, lots of people answered, so thank you to everyone that did answer. I'll just read um, a selection of them out now. Uh, Sasha Black says, Somewhere in the middle, pretty fiercely indie at the moment, but open to opportunities if they fit my business model. Uh, Dawn Chapman says, I'm indie and hybrid. I like both because I do all kinds of different things that help me. Jason Nugent says, I fall strongly on the indie side. I love the control over my work and the entire process. I don't look at it as a fallback due to traditional publishing failure. Success or failure is largely dependent on my actions. No one else. I like that kind of responsibility, which I absolutely agree with. Paddy Finn says, I'm fiercely indie. I'm in the business of making money for my business, not for someone else's business. That being said, I've signed away rights for formats where and when it made sense, but that will likely change as my business grows. And Jasmine Plate says, while there are some presses I would kill to be able to work with, part of me bulks at relinquishing control over things like cover art and design. Time will tell when my first book and the ones that follow end up, I suppose. Um, thank you to everyone that commented. I think it's pretty big general across the board that it seems to be a very malleable process and everyone has their own ways that they want to go. But I don't think anyone really sticks to one traditional path with something else pops itself up that is definitely worth consideration. And I think most people will take the time to consider that. Um... Next week's question of the week, based off of the content of this interview, will be, how do you tackle negativity and self-doubt with your writing? You can either pop into the Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash great writers share, uh, over on patreon.com forward slash great writers share, or just tag me on social media at Wilcox Author or use the hashtag great writers share. And yeah, that's all I, I have to say. So without any further ado, let's dive into the interview with the one, the only, Uplifting as hell, Jonathan Jans. Enjoy. Jonathan Jans is the author of more than a dozen novels and numerous short stories. His work has been championed by authors such as Joe R. Lansdale, Jack Ketchum and Brian Keane. He has also been lauded by Publishers Weekly, Library Journal and School Library Journal. His ghost story, The Siren and the Spectre, was selected as a Goodreads Choice nominee for Best Horror. Additionally, his novel Children of the Dark was chosen by Booklist as a top 10 horror book of the year. Jonathan's main interests are his wonderful wife and his three amazing children. Jonathan, welcome to the show. 
Thank you so much, Dan. It's awesome to be here. Man, I'm so excited to have you. I, I literally said before we hit record, I'm, I'm a big fan of your work. So it's nice to actually have a, a chance to sit down and dive into your brain. And I think the place that I kind of want to start this is um, one of the quotes on the front of your books and something that uh, is sort of plastered everywhere. And you can obviously see why is um, a quote from Brian Keane, which says, one of the best writers in modern horror to come along in the last decade, Jans is one of my new favorites. Can you talk through a little about how that came about to, uh, I guess, enter into your, your life and what it means to have someone like Brian Keene praise your work? Yeah, so uh, Brian, I'm always kind of late to modern authors' works um, just because I, I don't usually read them right when they come out, usually a little bit longer. And I think part of the reason why is because I like to read throughout the history of literature, right? I like to go way back and I'm as likely to read an Algernon Blackwood or an M.R. James story as I am a modern story. Um, and they're all great. They're just great in different ways. So I was a little late to Keene's work, uh, but when I did finally get to it, I read a book called Dark Hollow and just absolutely loved it. And then um, contacted him to let him know how much I appreciated it. And um, I think based on that, we, we began a dialogue. And then it, it was, wasn't terribly long after that, that he, on his, um, on his uh, website, he had this uh, best of the year, top 10 of the year. And he chose The Sorrows, which was my debut novel, as not only one of the best 10 of the year, I think it was like number seven on his list, but it was the highest rated horror novel um, altogether. The other six were other genres because he reads pretty widely. So he chose my debut as the best horror book of the year, which absolutely blew my mind. Um, and he was really the first person in the industry to champion my work, uh, to really throw down for me and to support me, which, you know, it, it's cool to have anybody do that. But to have one of your heroes do that is really kind of breathtaking. And we got to meet at the first Scares That Care convention in Williamsburg, Virginia. And, and, and our friendship has only grown since then. We've done a lot of conventions together. We either talk on the phone or text or whatever very frequently. And he's just taken me under his wing. And he's like a big brother to me, giving me invaluable advice, not just pro promoting my work, but helping me through challenging situations, answering questions, counseling me, you know, warning me against making mistakes. So he has definitely been my main mentor and has become a cherished friend. And that, that, that is something that I, I, I really appreciate, obviously. Mm. Now, one of the things that I love to dig into quite deeply on this show is the sort of mindset, the how people think, and particularly when it comes to um, writing, the obstacles that we can face. Because obviously it's a very, it can be a very challenging uh, career particularly when you're sat in a room by yourself and you've got all these different things and a lot of what we do is put ourselves on the line and basically let other people judge us for a living what were some of the mistakes that brian has helped you through if you're happy to list any of them at all if any of them spring to mind yeah if there's a mistake to be made dan i've made it um, <laughs> and he's helped me through some of them i think um i think one of them that i i, I think a lot of writers probably endure or encounter is undervaluing my own work. Um, I, and I'm not here to say that I'm some incredible author, but I, I tend to, if you can err on the side of too little confidence, confidence versus too much confidence, I tend to err on the side of self-doubt. And Brian is constantly there telling me, no, dude, you know, you, you, you are, you're good. You know, stop, stop looking at yourself this way. Stop accepting this deal or these terms or this or that, you know, strive for something better because your work is good enough to, to command that and, and, and you're good enough to deserve that. And so I think that, that, that that's the main thing he does is to just remind me that you you really need to to shoot for the moon you you won't always attain that but but why not start with the best possible expectation and then work your way down rather than settling and then wondering if you could have done better so i think with brian that's 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 his constant message and mantra to me and it's been really really helpful you know as far as other mistakes man we could we could do an entire <laughs> not just an hour we could do hours talking about the mistakes i've made um but that's his main contribution i think mm. and what did that initial uh contact with you guys look like you said that you you reached out um had you known him at that point or was it literally a cold call into brian hi this is who i am basically a cold call i and i think it might have even been snail mail 
But I, said, oh, wow. <laughs> I know, right? Is that so good? And that was back in 2010 or 11 that I sent him that letter. And I think it evolved into an online thing then from there where we talked on Facebook messages and emails, probably emails more, and then maybe some tw- Twitter messages and then eventually into you know, it, encounters in person and then texts and stuff and phone calls. So it was a pretty organic, natural evolution to, I guess, a more um, personalized communication. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, I listened to some of your interview on uh, This Is Horror and obviously this is going back to sort of 2018. Um I'm a big fan of Michael David Wilson and obviously the stuff that him and Bob Pastorello do over there. Great show. Uh, Great yeah. Show. <laughs> and you go very much into um, a lot of that kind of mindset. You go a lot of, you go into sort of uh, tutelage and the mentors and the people that have helped you. How, how important have you found having a mentor is to what your success has become? Indispensable. It's indispensable. I, Brian was my first and still my main Another one who's been indispensable to me, Jack, Jack Ketchum, Dallas Mayor. He was so important to me. He would always make time for me. He, you know, I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm somebody, but when I was just beneath nobody, <laughs> <laughs> no one in the world but my mom and my wife had heard of me, Brian and, and Jack Ketchum both treated me like somebody. Uh, which was just incredibly edifying because this is a, as you kind of alluded to, this is such a solitary and sometimes emotionally challenging uh, profession because you do, you're putting yourself out there, you're getting judged sometimes harshly. And, and then after, um, of course, Dallas passed away, unfortunately, um, just a beautiful man. And then um, all throughout, another guy that's been so important to me is Joe R. Lansdale. He's been so important. He's been, this summer, he counseled me on the phone for about 90 minutes. And the thing with Joe is that he's all about honesty. And sometimes that means like tough love and things you don't want to hear. And, and he'll, he'll talk in that Texas twang. I just love it. <laughs> but some, it's very pleasant to the ear, but sometimes the words aren't pleasant to hear. And it's like, oh, man, and he's not trying to hurt my feelings. He's just being, he's just leveling with me. But sometimes that, that honesty hits you like a gut punch. It's a gut punch you need, right? To kind of get to jolt yourself into reality because you, you've, you know, it helps disabuse you of notions that you've wrongly embraced. And then these, 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 falsities that you've conjured in your head to justify inaction in some cases, right? Mm -hmm. You you get complacent without realizing it. And Joe is there to like shake you, you know, metaphorically and get you out of that complacency and like, oh my gosh, he's right. I have been doing this. I got to get going. I've got to do this and this and this rather than what I've been doing. So in that sense, Joe has been just an extraordinary mentor. Another one, this, my most recent is a guy named Ryan Lewis and Ryan he is the most under the radar person, I think, in the world. I've never met anybody so humble. But he is the co-founder of Spin a Black Yarn, which Josh Mallerman, uh, the guy who wrote Bird Box, um, those two are the two people involved in that company. And Josh um, is the guy who wrote Bird Box. Ryan is like an executive producer of Bird Box, the movie. And Ryan is just this just magnificent, humble, wise, caring, awesome human being who has mentored me and taught me so much. He's like, not just with screenwriting, because that's, that's like a new profession I've been learning. He's been helping me with that. But he's just like little things. Like I always, again, I, I think that, you know, Dan, you know, this as a writer, there's disappointment to write is to suffer. <laughs> you know, you're going <laughs> to get over re- and over again, over and over again. You're going to get rejected. You're going to get told you're not good enough. You're going to get disappointed over and over again. You're going to get derided and reviews by people who just love to be nasty. And, and there are so many people like that, that but, but you know, you also find that there are more good than, 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 than mean. Um, but the mean, those really hurt. Right. And um, one thing with Ryan, like I'll say to myself, I'll say to Ryan, like we'll have this little like positive thing happen, like a studio will be interested in something or whatever. And then I'll say, well, I'm not getting my hopes up. All right. I know it's going to come to nothing. And I know that I know it's no big deal. And he's like, Jonathan, be excited. Be, (laughs) Be happy. Let yourself celebrate 
those little milestones and those little successes. You know, that's part of the joy that helps buoy us through these, these difficult times. And he said, absolutely be excited. Absolutely pump your fists and tell your family about it and, and hug your kids and hug your wife and, and celebrate. And he's given me permission to be excited about those things. And, and I think that helps guard against jadedness and cynicism. And, and so I think that these people who come into our lives, you know, Ryan and Lansdale and, and Dallas Mayor Jack Ketchum and, and Brian Keene, you know, Caroline Kepnes is another who really lifts me up. She's so awesome and loving and generous, nothing but kind, you know? Folks, if you're listening to this, if you ever, you know, w- go to buy a book, you do need to buy the newbies, you know? You do need to buy those people that are the small independent authors. But by all means, by Caroline Kepnes, by Joe Lansdale, by Josh Mallerman, who's become this cherished friend, because they're awesome human beings, okay? So don't not buy them because you think, oh, they don't need me. They're too successful. <laughs> you know, I think writers always need readers, right? Mm-hmm. They all, at every level, they need supported. Support those people too. They deserve it, and they're awesome, and they're loving, and they're cool, and, 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 and generous, and, and humble, all right? So um, and it, because th- these mentors that I'm talking about, and friends, that's, that's so much of my support network because they go through it too. They've been through it. Um, so I think it is invaluable. You cannot begin to quantify the importance of those mentors and that support system. How many of those mentors and friends are local to you within sort of very close range? And the reason, the reason I ask is because, um, I mean, I went full-time as an author April last year, so I'm approaching my one-year anniversary. And one thing that I found is, thank you, <laughs> one thing I found is particularly living where I live in, in the UK, I've got a lot of digital friends, but there aren't particularly people who live in the nearby area who I can connect with without having to travel you know, several hours to, to meet them. Do you, have, do you have that issue at all, or do you have those people sort of near enough that you can meet up and, and contact? Almost nobody around here. Um, there are some people I need to become friends with, like uh, Maurice Broadus um, is a really uh, awesome writer, and awesome person. He has this convention in Indianapolis called MoCon, uh, named after Maurice. And he is, uh, he's got something coming out from Tor, I think, fairly soon. Uh, so he's, he's a really accomplished writer and, and a really cool person. I don't know him well, just a little bit of online interaction. So that's a friendship I would like to cultivate. Um, just because I, I, the people I know, know him like Mary San Giovanni and, and, and Maurice is their friends. And then Brian Keene and Maurice are friends and they all just swear by how awesome he is. So that's somebody I'd like to become friends with. He's fairly like an hour and a half away. Another one is like with like within three hours is Tim Wagner is mm. relatively close. And Tim's another mentor. Tim is so generous and humble and awesome. And he's won every award there is, uh, but he doesn't act like it. You know, he's, he's so always willing to help. So that's a fairly local guy. But then again, most of our interactions are digital. About the only guy within uh, a 10 hour radius I see is Josh Mallerman. We, uh, I drove up to Michigan to see him about um, you know, three or four, four or five months ago. And uh, he lives about five hours away. But honestly, he's probably the closest that I have seen in person recently. Um, so yeah, almost everything like you, Dan, is digital. Mm-hmm. And I, I do find that's the thing. It's like, you know, we, I, and I probably do this too, we bash social media. There are a lot of negative offshoots of social media. I think it leads to depression in a lot of ways. However, it also <laughs> does provide the, these connections that we never otherwise would have. So that's a really beautiful aspect of it. Mm. You use the word uh, cultivate when talking about some of the relationships that you want to build, you want to sort of generate and make stronger. How deliberate are you with choosing the positive relationships in your life? And are there ever any situations in which you have to consciously purge negativity? Absolutely both. I think that, that positive people are drawn to each other. I think that you can just sense, you can sense when somebody is not there to emotionally destroy you. And, and you appreciate that. You appreciate the fact that, oh my goodness, this person, A, doesn't think the universe re- revolves around him or her. And then B, this person doesn't want me to fail. And that's something because there are plenty of people who do want you to fail. They might, they're not going to say it, but you can just start to sense this growing toxicity the more that you interact with them. And I'm, I'm not I'm not criticizing anybody who who is ceremonious about this. I am very unceremonious. I just cut it off. 
I just stop interacting with that person and, and they'll, they'll never hear from me again just because I, there are too many awesome people for me to waste my time on that. And I'm not, I'm not an unforgiving person. I'm not a vindictive person. I'm never going to wish ill on that person. I'm never going to try to sabotage that person because that's not how I roll. But if a person is just nasty or really selfish or really unkind, because again, Dan, I, I, you can you can sense it. You can sense it. There's there's for example, there's the difference between an, a, a negative review that's constructive and honest, and a negative review that's just gleeful and just cruel. And you can just tell the person is enjoying. And maybe it's because I'm a, a parent and a teacher, but you know, I, I see in every writer. Somebody who is, you know, I see my students, I see these people who are trying to learn and trying to express themselves and trying to live their dreams. And I don't take pleasure when they fail. And I don't take pleasure when a book they write doesn't work. And so I'm probably just apt not to say anything. And, 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 the, and, and there's nothing wrong with negative criticism. There are people who do that and do it well and do it respectfully and undestructively. But just for me personally, I would never want to be somebody to kill someone's happiness or passion or joy or self-image. And so I try very hard not to do that. So when, when I do notice that toxicity, I just go the other direction and I gravitate toward... You mentioned the people on This Is Horror, Michael and Bob. They're genuinely kind human beings. I, I, and I've never met either one in person, but I can just tell that they are the kind of people that, that want others to succeed. And I respect that. So Yeah. I've got an upcoming interview with uh, Michael David Dawson for people listening. So a little teaser for you guys there. Within the, the next few weeks, you'll be listening to him and getting some of his insights. Um, awesome. Yeah, but I want to I wanna jump back a little bit because I know that obviously to people listening now, there's definitely the... Um, interpretation that you're this massive positive positive guy you've got all this really good mindset uh, <laughs> skills it's all and 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 you are and that's definitely how you come across but it wasn't always that way for you and obviously you started with quite a a dark and troubled uh, childhood so at what point do you feel was there a turning point in your life in which it suddenly started to go the other way were you trying to be positive during those darker times when you were younger and obviously if you want to go a little bit into sort of what those um how how your childhood was then by all means go ahead yeah, that's 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 a great question. I think uh, that's I try to tell my son this because I never want my son. And again, I'm not saying I'm some great person or whatever, but I never want my son or my daughters to feel like they have to 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 copy this trait or to be this or to be like me in whatever way. Because what I tell my son is, you're looking at somebody on down the road. You're not looking at the 14 year old kid. You're not looking at the, the terrified four-year-old or eight-year-old or honestly even the terrified 35-year-old that I, that I once was. You're not looking at any of those versions. You're looking at somebody who's, who's come out the other side of those things and is still deeply flawed and still has massive insecurities. And, and so, yeah, I think that um, you know my mom, my grandfather, my grandma, my aunt, all four of them helped raise me. And they've always been very supportive of me and very positive, and that that helped. Uh, you know, when I was a really little kid, it was the, the my 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 father. He was out of the picture, sort of, by the time I was four. But that wasn't a very good situation, and so I think because of that, because of the interactions I had with him, I was very fearful as a child, and 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 remained that way for a long time. So I've always known fear, and I've always known. Um, insecurity and doubt. And you know, you know what, maybe, and I don't mean to make him the boogeyman. He passed on a few years ago. You know, maybe some of that is my hard wiring. Maybe that is my natural. I do believe it's a combination of nature and nurture. And maybe there are parts of me that were just predisposed to be insecure or fearful or whatever. But I, um, I, I really tend to, to doubt myself. I tend to, to feel like I'm not good enough for whatever reason. Or combination of reasons. And so I think that what that does, though, I think I can do two, two things with that. I can turn that into let that become bitterness and anger and turn that outward. Or I can let it turn inward and make sure I don't make others feel that way. What that also sometimes tends to lead to is this, this self-abusive cycle where I'm constantly so this this sounds like I'm a total sounds like I'm this bizarre 
but I'll wake up every morning and still as I shower, I'm assaulted with these, with my mistakes. Like every mistake that I can remember just hits me as I shower. And sometimes I'm like writhing in like my head under the shower head, trying to rid myself, trying to wash away these mistakes and the pain I feel and the guilt that I feel because of sometimes how I've negatively affected others. Um, and so I think that what that does, it motivates me to not make others feel that way. I got to tell you, my grandfather is one of my role models. He's 94. He turns 95 in April. And he had a really rough childhood. My great grandfather, whom I never met, was a very unhappy person. And he used to call my grandpa um, fat, stupid, lazy, um, all kinds of horrible things. And my grandpa had no confidence at all, none. And, you know, he had two ways to go with that. He could have either perpetuated that cycle of verbal abuse and made other people feel bad, or he could know how bad it was and try to make others feel better. And that's what he did. He is the most, one of the most loving men I've ever met. He's a loving father to my mom, loving husband to my grandma who passed on and a loving grandfather to me. And, and then I, I think I tried to, to model that. I try very hard with my students. I try to be extra sensitive to them to make sure that they at least have that one period of the day where they're accepted and when they're cared about and valued. And then I try, try again, I don't always succeed, but I try to do that with my students and my, 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 my kids, my own children and my wife. I try so hard for them not to feel the same self-doubt in self-abuse that I engage in. And I try to get them to, and it's painful because it doesn't always work. You know, I see one of my daughters, she doubts herself a lot. And my son does doubts himself too sometimes. And the thing is, they're extraordinary. They're amazing human beings, but they don't always see that. So um, I try very hard to um, not erase that pain, but to get them to think of themselves differently and to think of themselves the way that I do, which is to see all the beauty because uh, they're just awesome. So sorry about that. I feel like I'm giving these really long-winded answers. No, the no, they're perfect. The questions are really good. So <laughs> that, that's that's why. So mm. blame Dan, listeners. Blame Dan for my it's long-winded. Completely my fault. And it's fantastic as the host when the, the guest is talking lots and lots because it means I have to do less. But um, no, absolutely. Thank you for for sharing that as well. And I think one thing to highlight there, is, as you so eloquently put, is it's it's a process. And I know that um, something that I've never fully really, I don't think I've ever shared in public was I know that when I was at college, I went through two years of what is essentially um, this solipsistic self punishment cycle. So I was very much similarly, I would end rather than the beginning of the day waking up and going through all those thoughts, I would end the day and literally in my head list every single interaction I'd had with the person and why that was stupid and why that sucked and why that could have been better. Absolutely. And to come out of the other side of that and to be in a position where you've learned from that experience, you've grown and you're able to take whatever lessons you've learned into other areas of your life um, is very, very beneficial and something that, like you say, particularly people who are quite young in their journey don't haven't yet experienced enough to be able to use that and have that in their toolkit. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think what you just said is so, that's my life, man, that, that, that going to bed and trying to sleep and being unable to, because you're going through everything you, you know, you can have an interaction. I had an interaction with Ryan last night on the phone. We talk on the phone every other day and text every day. And I, I made a joke at the end. You, you, you ever like, you're talking to somebody and there's a natural conclusion to your conversation, mm -hmm. right? And it's and it should end there, but then occasionally we just try to get one more funny quip in. I mean, not not a mean one, not making fun of anybody, but just but you're like, oh, that was so lame. Shut <laughs> 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 up! I should have let it end before, and I did that last night. I like I like went back to a joke I'd already made, and it had been it had been played out. And then I'm like, you idiot! What's wrong with you? Ryan thinks you're such a tool, <laughs> yeah. and, and he probably didn't think anything of it. But then I'm I'm just sitting there, you know, beating myself up like you can't you just shut up when it's time to shut up <laughs> conversation sooner next time so i totally relate to what you just said mm. but then the truth is that you probably won't finish earlier next time and you'll probably still do the same because that's that's just part of the fabric of who you are probably yeah because mm. i know I'm, I'm exactly the same as always that you always have to be the last word um <laughs> i'd love to go back a little bit into so obviously we've done a lot of mindset stuff i'd love to go a bit more into craft and your journey into horror and everything else and one of the things I picked up in uh, one of the interviews I listened to was um, 
number one, I, I found it astounding. You said you hadn't read anything until you were 14 years old. And then when you were 14, you picked up a Stephen King book, as is most people's entry point into books in general. It doesn't even have to be horror. Um, but my question around that was, well, kind of twofold there. Uh, number one, how had you managed to avoid books for 14 years? And I don't judge it in any way because I've got a brother who's, I think, oh, how old is my brother? He's 30 now. Um, I'm pretty sure he's never read a book cover to cover in his life. That's just, it's just not part of who he is. Um, and the second one is, what Stephen King book was it? And why was that particularly so gripping for you? Yeah, I think the first question is a pretty straightforward answer. I didn't think I was smart enough. I didn't think I was smart enough to understand it because I, was, I felt intellectually inferior. I had convinced myself that I was an imbecile. And that's why I didn't try it, because books represented to me my own ineptitude, my own lack of intelligence. And then as far as the King book, it was the Tommyknockers. And it's so funny because King himself, when you get to, you know, nobody ever gets to where he is and nobody ever gets to his body of work. But King is to a point where he can say, well, I like this book and I don't like this book of my own bibliography. He doesn't like the Tommyknockers, if I remember correctly. I think two he doesn't like very well are the Tommyknockers and Christine, I think. I'm pretty sure those are two that he's not fond of. And the thing is, though, is that the Tommyknockers, King at his worst, is, in my opinion, really, really good. And the Tommyknockers was so transporting to me. It was so mesmerizing, so interesting. And it, it was that exercise of becoming somebody else, like becoming, I think Gardner is her last name, the character's last name that we start with in that book, pretty sure. This woman who lives kind of in the forest. I was there. I was, in, I was there. And I never really thought that deeply about how um, a woman that age might feel. And I think that's one of the greatest things about about reading. It, it makes the world a better place if you let it, because it's it's this exercise in empathy, this exercise in seeing through others' eyes. And I love that, and King gave me that, and continues to give me that. So it was the Tommy Knockers, and even if he doesn't like it, I still love it. Mm. And how do you approach reading now? Because I know that in my personal experience, I growing up, I I read a lot. I used to I, I used to love reading. I still love reading. Um, but I, I remember distinctly points in my life in which hours would go by. You're in this world. You're transported. You re, you're just genuinely not in your body. And I find now that when I'm reading, I'm either in one of two modes. And number one is I'm transported and I'm gone and like I'm I'm deep in the book and I'm just tearing through the pages. Um, as was the case with well with Wolfland and also with uh, Josh Malaman, who we obviously mentioned earlier, his Bird Box uh, I read last year, and it was another one that just carried me through the pages. So good. There's there's that mode, or there's the over analytic mode of me trying to study every sentence as I'm reading it and try and work out what it is I love about that sentence and break it down. That there isn't really a middle ground for me. I don't know is, is that sort of familiar with you? How do you how do you how has your approach to reading changed? Yeah, I think what I've become is a very slow reader. And I read much more slowly than most people I know. And I think really those two things you're talking about, that being transported, that entertainment feeling or the feeling of studying it and being analytic, um, for me, they've become really intertwined. And, and I do those both simultaneously. And I think that's because of what I do for a living. You know, I'm constantly like today, my students and I were studying a play called The Miracle Worker and by William Gibson about the life of Helen Keller and Annie Sullivan. And we're studying that as a text. And so as we're reading it, yeah, I'm entertained by it, but I'm also studying William Gibson's word choice. And tomorrow in my creative writing class, we're going to study this book called, or this short story called Prey, P-R-E-Y, by Richard Matheson, which has been made into a short movie several times, most famously with Karen Black in this made-for-TV movie called Trilogy of Terror. And as I am entertained by that story by Richard Matheson, I'm always entertained by Matheson. I love him. I'm also studying his craft. I'm studying his sentence structure. I'm studying his, his, the, the way that he will set up a scare by diverting us. He's like a magician with a slate of hand. And so I do those two things simultaneously because that's, 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 as a teacher, that's what you do. And I also teach film literature. So today we studied Vertigo. And I'm entertained by Jimmy Stewart's performance. I'm entertained by Kim Novak. I'm entertained by Bernard Herrmann's music and Alfred Hitchcock's direction. But I'm studying them as artists. And, and now I'm studying the screenplay in a new way that I never would have before this past August when Ryan started to you know, teach me how to write a screenplay. So I'm simultaneously enjoying it and picking it apart in my head. And, I, and I'm not doing that because I'm any 
great scholar or, or anything like that. I'm just doing it. And I do that here at home when I, I read before bed. Uh, I'm reading a, a Tanana of Dew short story collection called Ghost Summer. And I'm doing the same thing as I read her work because A, she's a genius, but then B, because she's also really entertaining. Uh, and I, I think that's just because I'm so conditioned to do that every day as a profession. I now do that when I watch a movie with my children, when I read a book in bed, I do that all the time now. And I think that's just because I'm, I'm programmed to do it. Does it ever hinder you? Do you ever wish you can switch it off or are you happy with that approach? There was a time for a while that I was annoyed by it because I'm like, <laughs> stop, stop, stop looking at, stop, stop paying attention to the, to the edits, you know, the, the cutting in this movie. Just, just let, let the, let the Avengers try to destroy Thanos. Stop, stop <laughs> paying attention to, to the cross cutting among these different sets of characters. Uh, yeah. So it, sometimes I get a little like, you know, self remonstrative and annoying, uh, annoyed with myself, but, but mainly it's just now kind of my reality. It's like my little cross to bear, <laughs> mm-hmm. but, but it's, it's also kind of fun. You know, I, I like that. I, I like that. I look at it in my own way. And I kind of embraced that. Honestly, man, Dan, it, was, it wasn't until my early 40s that I began to accept myself. Um, and it's like now, you know, in my mid 40s, I can just kind of accept myself for the weird nerd that I am and just kind of go with it. And yeah, and my, sometimes my kids roll their eyes at me, but, <laughs> but it's fine because I can roll my eyes at myself and still accept myself. What changed for you? At what point did you sort of embrace that self-definition of yourself? I guess, I guess it was, honestly, it was the love of other people and the acceptance of other people. Uh, I found enough people who cared about me and, and loved me in, in the different areas of my life. You know, if, if my wife loves me after knowing her all this time, you know, I must not be all bad. You know, if my kids... <laughs> Uh, if my kids see me every day, they see my flaws, they see my bad moods, and they still love me, then there must be something there, you know, of some worth. And in, in when I when I have these interactions with with the people we've mentioned, you know, um, if they if these mentors of mine take the time to care about me, and and spend time with me and help me, there must be something decent there, you know. And my grandpa still loves me, and my mom. And I know how corny that sounds, but I think the love of others can can can, I guess, mitigate those flaws we have, and and undo the damage that is done in the natural course of life. Because we all go through. People can be so mean, man. People can be so cruel. I tell my students that every day, my my belief on the ceiling and floor of human behavior, the, the ceiling rises and the floor drops every day. I can't believe how vicious and selfish people can be. And I also can't believe how unselfish and loving and caring and, and generous people can be. Um, and I guess the more I go, even though the, 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 the lower end disillusions you a little bit, I think even greater, the, the, the upper end, the higher end, that love, it really does, to me, it conquers. It, it, it overcomes, it usurps those negative feelings because it is just so beautiful and amazing. Mm. I've, a, I've got a five-year-old who I've found that I'm very, very conscious of the language that I use around him because I'm constantly aware of how other parents talk to their children, not necessarily always in a judgmental way, but there's definitely um, a tendency that I found of even within my own language, which has been obviously built from what my parents have said to me and things of um, almost sugarcoating adulthood, glorifying adults as a role within society. And I know that when I'm with my son and he's asking me questions and he's saying things like, you know, everything, don't you, dad? That I'm deliberately taking those opportunities to go, no, no, I don't, don't. And I find that really difficult to navigate sometimes because part of you goes, give that child that illusion so they can live in that, that, that bubble while they can, because obviously once the bubble of innocence bursts, then there's nothing that you can pull back. But at the same time, if you don't give them the tools and the honesty that they need to go forward and live a realistic life, then are you doing them a disservice? Yeah. Yeah. That's in the, what you're talking about is that constant internal conflict, mm-hmm. that constant juggling, that constant struggle. And here's the thing you don't know. And I don't know. Nobody knows, right? There's no yep. manual for this, and it's the most important job we'll ever do. 
and it's the job we care about the most, but we have no clue. We're just going on our gut. We're going on whatever intellect we have. Look, my son just walked <laughs> to, to him. And, you know, we don't know. And that's the thing. It's like you don't want to, you don't want your kids to think you're an idiot because, because you do know something and you do have some life experience and you do want to help the kid. And if you cast yourself as totally inept and lost, then, you know, why the heck are they going to listen to you? But at the same time, if you, as you're saying, is you try to, you know, make of yourself this sensei, this ultimate, you know, authority on everything, then then you become not only unapproachable, but I think a little too judgmental sounding. And you become this um, paragon to which they can never live up. And I think that begins to, to make them feel um, worse about themselves. That makes them feel ill-equipped to deal with life because, oh, you know, if I were more like Dan, more like dad, then I would be happy, but I'm not. He knows everything and I'm a disappointment. I'm a failure. And obviously you don't want your kid to ever feel that way. What role does story play in your parenting style? Huh. Interesting. Well, I think um, that's, that's really, really interesting. I think that I think that as you, yeah, I think we're, we're storytellers, you know, you're a sto- storyteller and I'm a storyteller. And, you know, in addition to having, you know, stories at the center of your lives, both your own and then the ones you read um, and the ones you read with your kids, I think that you can draw parallels between both writing and literature and movies, you know, that's a form of storytelling, you know, using those as teachable moments or just using those as conversation starters and you know analogies or illusions that can help you guys communicate um and i think that's really and i think it's good for them to you know to look at that i think it's really good for them to like my kids and i will watch a marvel movie together and it's it's so like last night uh, we were watching thor to the dark world which is one of the lesser Marvel movies, yes. but uh, <laughs> it is, you know, but I was ruminating on the relationship, the dynamic between um, Thor and his father, Odin. And then and I know my son, my son's bright. And I know he's thinking the same things, right? Trying to figure out here because Thor goes a different way than his dad does. And, you know, that's, that's an interesting jumping off point for both of us to just think about and then eventually maybe articulate and and, and examine. And that's, you know, and then I always, based on that, I was talking to my son about how he's gifted in ways that I'm not. Um, so there, you know, story, I think plays a role. I mean, obviously there is no, Chris Hemsworth is just essaying a role as is Anthony Hopkins, but through that fictional dynamic, I think that, you know, we can begin to explore not only the present, but the, then the future and the possibilities. And, and I can articulate things to my son that might be more difficult to otherwise, because we have a point of reference. Um, yeah, so I think that there's, there's just one of many ways in which it can play a role. What about yeah, for you? What about for me? Uh, I mean, I know that I, I'm not pushy with making my son read. He's I'm quite lucky in the fact that, I mean, like I say, he's five and he's only really learned to read properly in the last four or five months. Um, and he's, he's picking up everything he can. He's, he's loving it. And I'm definitely keen to facilitate and provide opportunities for him to continually learn and to find out all these different story opportunities and not really limit himself to certain things. Cause obviously, um, school will provide a certain canon of books that they provide to everyone, but I'm trying to uh, give him the opportunity to look left, right, and center and, and try different things. And, um, I had the joy of introducing him to a library last week and giving him his first library card and he had a, a fun experience then. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm just aware that the more, the more you push something, the more kids push back. So I'm kind of, I'm providing the opportunities. I'm giving him this plethora of things to, uh, explore. And then if he picks up, he picks up. Um, and for me, I actually last year wrote a children's book specifically for him to teach him manners. And I had a, a, a school friend of mine illustrate it and put it, put it together. So um, even though it wasn't, it wasn't so much to push for sales for me, it was literally a selfish endeavor of providing something for him to, to read. Um, and that experiment's worked well and he loves it and he's featured in the book himself. Uh, but yeah, I think lots of different avenues, like you say, there's, there's film, there's TV, there's every opportunity to 
show him that good can triumph when bad shows its face and, and use that as a, a jumping off point to teach some lessons to him. Well, absolutely. That's the thing, you know, here, and I know I'm sticking with movies here. I mean, you know, we're both readers, of course. But but then again, you know, I, I tell my film lit students, you know, we, we do have a textbook. It's every film we study. You know, mm-hmm. that is our text, and it, it's reading in the dark. And, um, you know, the a character that my son and I, we've been rewatching Marvel movies is Captain America. And it's been so just um, enlivening and invigorating for me you know i i'm as i'm as starry-eyed and wide-eyed and impressionable now as i was when i was my son's age who's 14 when i was at age five or six um i am completely impressionable and i'm still influenced by what i see i mean not in negative ways but in positive ways and i think the the character of captain america mm-hmm. it's just yeah people roll their eyes oh that's so simple and corny and cliche i don't care when, when he tells the doctor, the doctor quizzes him and he says, you want to go kill Nazis? He says, I don't want to kill anybody. I just don't like bullies. It's like, oh my gosh, that's so important. What a lesson. What a mm-hmm. great way for somebody to think and what a great way to frame one's approach to that difficult situation or any situation. And, 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 and it really, I think stories like that and characters like that, they, they remind you of what you really believe and they remind you that it's good to believe that and it's good to live by that. And and so I just, I I love, I cherish, I cherish the different stories that we consume and study and experience and all that they bring to our lives. Like I wish I could meet Chris Evans. I wish I could (laughs) meet him and shake his hand and just say, man, you know, you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for inspiring not only my son, but for inspiring me. And um, honestly, when I follow him on Twitter, he's inspirational there too, right? Trying to argue for a more inclusive society. Um, I think he, he, he lives up to Captain America in real life. Um, just a cool dude. So anyway, I know I sound like a nerd here, but I don't, <laughs> I'm, good with, I'm good with being a nerd. Mm. No, I'm absolutely the same. And I think uh, particularly when it comes to Chris Evans, I know that I was one of the, the naysayers that was apprehensive about him taking that role. Obviously, after he did the whole Human Torch thing and everything else, and I was like, okay, how can you really bring this? Um, and what you're saying there about him being just a decent person in, in general, if people are interested, there's a YouTube video of him talking openly about his anxiety and about his depression, um, mostly centered around the fact if I've either got two videos modeled up or this is in one video, um, but primarily talking about the weight of the decision to sign on as Captain America, because in the beginning, obviously, it was a 10 year commitment. And if you commit to 10 years and the film flops like within the first year, you're stuck. Um, so he talks quite openly about that, which is sort of really interesting. Um, and by the way, you've done something that no one's ever done on my show, which is bounce back a question at me. So thank you for that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so much yes. today. The first, um, I, I got to watch those videos. That when we're done, if you'd send me the links or the, at least the, the the keywords to search, because I would love to watch that. I mean, I already have a positive impression of the guy, but sounds like that's something that I would benefit from watching too. Mm. Yeah, I'll try and find them and shoot them over. Um, one thing that I did want to touch on with you is that um, coming back to your writing, your writing style, um, I'd love to know a little bit more about how you specifically hone your craft. And even more specifically, one thing that I loved when I read through um, Wolfland last year uh, is you seem to have obviously a wide grasp of the English language. Even when you talk, you're very, very eloquent with um, how you communicate your points. A lot of well, any time, because I have raved about this book on several podcasts and several reviews, one of the big things that really appealed to me was that you speak about the viscera and the gore and all the actual horror elements of the book in such a poetic way that, for me, it felt really unique because, I mean, I think you put in the intro of uh, Wolfland, it's probably one of your darkest where you've really sort of driven home um, those elements. Yeah. But where do, you, where do you hone your craft and create such a poetic way of, of storytelling? Well, that's very kind of you. That, that's an incredible compliment. I appreciate it. I think that it comes back to the people I read. Um, one writer I don't think I've talked a whole lot about elsewhere, I'll talk about now, is Robert McCammon. Uh, Robert oh, McCammon. Fantastic. He, he, is, he is a poet, mm-hmm. um, he is a wordsmith. And the thing is, though, is that it's not like Stephen King, and Stephen King's my favorite and always will be, and I love him so dearly. Stephen King talks about the look ma, how well I'm writing syndrome, right? Where it's like the the writing is trying to butt out the characters, right? The writing 
trying to take center stage. And what McCammon does so extraordinarily and what I would like to achieve, because I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I don't think impeccable word choice and, and sparkling turn of phrase are separate from pace and immersive storytelling. I think that they can go together and actually enhance one another and, and, and become fused in this, in this glorious marriage of style and narrative. And I think Robert McCammon does that. I think he is, he's just, and, and that's the thing, this is where the, uh, the, the way that I read now, it, it, it really is rewarding with McCammon because I am simultaneously experiencing the dread of this character as she flees some menace, but also marveling and gasping over Robert McCammon's incredible turn of phrase and this, this semi-obscure but perfectly deployed adjective, right? He doesn't choose this word because it's atypical. He chooses it because it's the right word for that circumstance. And that's and he uses it unabashedly, right? Because we, we trust him. He's not trying to draw attention to himself, himself. He's still being invisible and humble as a storyteller, yet he's doing it in such a commanding incredible way um that that's the kind of that's the kind of writer i want to be i want to be that guy that, that can do all those things and i'm not saying i am but i'm saying that that mccammon shows me how that can work and, and that makes me aspire to do better and, and there are other writers that are like that as well i mentioned caroline kepness earlier my goodness she's so good like her her, her voice is so resonant and powerful um yet it's all at the service of the story it's all to you know to to move things forward and to reveal character um so yeah yeah but mccammon man he is irreplaceable legend love that dude i definitely need to read more of him i've read the i read a boy's life a couple of years ago which was that's one of the few i haven't i haven't uh, been ever to punch me when i say that i haven't read <laughs> i've read like eight others but that's what that's one i haven't read it's definitely less so on the horror side but it's just that magic it just it just it just overwhelms you in nostalgia and it's so it's it's like uh without getting too poetic now but you know those mornings where you're sitting and the sun's sort of just creeping over and you just get hit by the first rays of sun that is generally how you feel through that the entire book it's it's incredible um but one thing that i do find is that there are so many good horror authors and particularly i mean i've read horror for probably about 13 14 years but my horror was very narrow when i began um it was very much king focused or barker or very sort of very very um narrowed down the tunnel and i'm now at the point where i'm widening and i'm looking at these different authors but there are so many different authors that i'm now in the sickness of reading one person or one book from one person just to get a flavor before i go to the next person just so you have these reference points you can see where your tastes lie and you, you just get overwhelmed sometimes with reading um yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, and there's just, that's what's so cool. There's so much good stuff being written now, you know? It's mm -hmm. like, it's, it's impossible to keep up. I just read Mallory by Josh Mallerman. And um, that's, uh, it's just an extraordinary, epic and intimate novel. It's so beautiful. So good. I just love it so much. And uh, it's almost the kind that makes you, that is like, makes you shake your head in jealous, jealousy. You're like, oh man, how, how do you do it that well, right? Um, you know, but you, you also marvel at it and appreciate it and, and, and love it. Um, but you're right. There's just so, you're, there's so much good stuff there. You said 13 or 14 years you've been reading. Um, mm. and, so, and then you, you feel like you've branched out into quite a few others. Mm. Um, yeah. And I, I got, you know, here's, let me tell you, I'm going to admit to a flaw here. Um, and something I'm not proud of and something I'm trying to rectify. I think that horror has been traditionally skewed toward uh, male authors mm -hmm. and honestly skewed toward white male authors. And it's not like I think white males are evil because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Caucasian and, and, and male myself. But um, I think that that is really, really unfortunate and has really... Um, repressed a lot of really wonderful voices and then what i'm trying to do and, and i gotta tell you there's a selfish element too i become better the more i read um you know uh, people of color i become better the more i read um uh, female authors the more i read people that aren't like that aren't exactly like me um in whatever way 
And, and so that's, I think, where my reading has really grown in the last several years. And, you know, I'm embarrassed to say that I, I read, I, 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 I didn't do it strategically or, or, or mean, or, you know, in, in a cruel way or trying to exclude others. It just sort of happened. I just didn't think much about my reading choices. But, but now that I'm reading, you know, with greater diversity, it's, it's not only you know, opening my eyes to different experiences. It's making me a far better writer. And I think maybe a, a better human, you know, because there are things that I just, I can't know from my own experience, you know, unless I shut up and read about other people's perspectives and experiences, how am I going to know them? How am I going to have any idea what people go through? Um, and so, you know, reading Victor Laval, reading, re- reading um, Laurel Hightower, she's, she's a, a book I read the other day. Um, it's just so... It, it, it's so invigorating and so essential, I think. Um, and it just makes, it makes my life better. And, and, and having more voices, I think it just makes everything better. And it's so, so overdue, man. It's so overdue. Um, and I think that it's important for, for, you know, it's important for writers to recognize, you know what, I haven't been reading diversely. I've not been actively trying to oppress others, but I sure haven't been helping. You know, I sure haven't been been giving voice to, or giving um, you know, opportunities to other. Um, I, I've been I've been hearing um, th- there was a statement I saw the other day. It was so eloquent. It said that it's not enough to be to not be racist. It's important to be anti-racist, mm-hmm. right? And that's a very different thing than just not being racist. Um, and I think that you know it needs to. Yeah, uh, you know, an African American writer, you know, can speak about diversity. You know, but 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 being in the minority, you know, it's so important for people who are not being oppressed to also try to stand up and, and champion those voices. Um, because I haven't had to face any discrimination. The, the, stack, the, the deck is stacked for me, you know, and then it's in, that means it's incumbent upon me to, to try to um, to, 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 to bring attention to others whose voices have been silenced for so long. Um, so I think that, that, that my reading is, is still evolving and I've got a lot of work to do. Um, but that, for me, at least, that's where my reading has really changed over the last half decade. I've kind of realized how narrow I've been. Um, and I still read King. I still love King. Was, you know, he's, he's amazing. But, but I'm, I'm reading others than King too. Mm. I love that. It's definitely the importance of championing um, those who traditionally haven't had a voice. And I think from what I've experienced anyway, there's generally a sense of nostalgia around horror. Horror tends to, from what I see from other people who consume horror, there's always a tendency to lean towards the old classic titles with the old classic covers of the 50s, 60s, 70s. That seems to be where people particularly begin, but where a lot of people also stay. And there's definitely, um, as you've kind of spoken to already, a, sur- a resurgence of of modern contemporary horror from people of all different walks of life. And it's definitely um, much more reflective of today's society. And it's, it's like, like you say, there's a thousand benefits to branching out to reading different peoples and actually championing that side of, of horror. Um, so I definitely commend sort of the, the stuff that you said there. Um, one question that I do have, and then I'm going to have to start wrapping up, which sucks because I've got a thousand more questions for you. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in your writing process because obviously you say you teach as well. So at what point during the day or the week do you put pen to paper? Um, and what does your writing process from inception of an idea to actual publication look like for you? Oh man, it's just so weird and bizarre. <laughs> Counterintuitive. Uh, first of all, during the school year, which is nine and a half months, I don't write much during the, the the week at all because, frankly, I am, and I try to keep, I try to walk the walk instead of just talking the talk. Uh, so I, I always prioritize my family number one, my my teaching number two, and then my writing number three. It's not that my writing isn't important, but you know, working with students, I, I feel like that's a pretty darn important job. And being a writer is an important job too, don't get me wrong. But, you know, I have direct contact with these kids every day. I better darn well be there and completely present with them and focus completely on them, which I do. So the writing takes a huge hit during the school year. I edit at night after my kids go to bed. That's when I edit my novels. And then I write on the weekends. I write for about three hours each day in the mornings. So I write during the school year about six hours a week. 
and that, that that's not much. And um, but I'm still able to get about a I don't know may, a novel written over the course of the nine and a half months, and then I'm able to write another novel during the summer, and that's when I go wild. All right, that's when I'm writing every day, three or four thousand words, and just going in in this white heat. And I just love it; it's so awesome. And then again, I'll edit after my kids go to bed at night. Um, so that's my process as far as actually writing is concerned. And then um, with regard to like editing, I take longer to edit than I do to write. A lot longer, probably twice as long to edit, maybe even three times as long to edit. Because my first drafts are wretched. My first drafts are just train wrecks, disasters. And I slowly, slowly start to make something first presentable out of this just this miasma, uh, this monolithic, unwieldy mass of words chiseling away, cutting here, trimming there, tweaking here. I start to make it manageable. And then the fun happens. And that's when I can really start to sharpen the language and, and add that sparkle that, you know, to which I aspire because I'm not a good first draft writer at all. I know writers who, who do. Brian Smith is a writer. I think he, um, he edits his books, obviously, but I get the impression his first drafts are pretty strong because um, he, he writes r- pretty rapidly. Jeff Strand is another one. I mean, I'm sure he edits his stuff. I'm not, I'm not at all disparaging them. I'm complimenting them. I think they write much better first drafts than I do. So I don't think that they, they, they edit you know, quite as much as I do, because I don't think they have to. I just think that their their first drafts are sharper. I'm not one of those guys. I'm not a guy who can just, you know, crank one out and make it good the first time through. I've got to really go back and then go back again and set it aside and let it sit for a couple of months and then go back to it again and try to make it good. So it takes me a long time to get there. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely, there's a common theme um, among every guest I've had that Although, as you say, some first drafts are cleaner than others, yeah. editing is where the magic happens, where you really nail it down, make your voice, make the story sharp and get it to a position where it's actually, it's actually sellable. Yeah, yeah. I think for most writers it is. I think Jeff and um, Brian are the exceptions. And again, I could be totally wrong. I know they edit their stuff. I just also know that, you know, just listening to them talk and on Facebook and stuff, I just get the sense that they are... Um, they're just, I think they just have a better focus than I do. Maybe a better, maybe innate sense of where the characters are going and where the stories are going than I do. Um, so that is, and, and it is you, as you know, I mean, that's meant to be purely complimentary. Um, and I could be totally wrong. Maybe, maybe they let their manuscripts sit there for a year and then, and then edit them for another year. So maybe I'm just completely up a tree. So who knows? Uh, and the final question I've got before we go into uh, Patreon questions, I've got one more question for you, Jonathan Jones, which is, why do you write? <laughs> wow. Big so question. Many, yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's hard to answer because there's so many reasons. I think, you know, I, I could just be that cheesy, aloof author and say, well, I write because I have to. Right? <laughs> um, and, and, but the fact is, is that that's sort of true. It's sort of true that I have to. I get really, I feel worse about myself when I'm not writing. I feel dissatisfied with myself. I feel a little grumpy. I try not to take it out on my family. But when I haven't written for a while and haven't worked on my books for a while, I'm not the same. I'm just not the same. And I I think maybe it's because I hate waste. I hate waste. I hate missed opportunities. I hate um, wasted potential. Um, Every minute of every period of every class I have taught since my student teaching, I have planned out to the minute. Um, And I have tried to utilize every single moment to maximize because my kids time my students time it's important i've only got them for 250 minutes a week and i darn well better make those minutes meaningful and i try to carry that same attitude into my um familial life and then i try to carry that same attitude into my life and i feel like i don't think i have many gifts i i i'm not great at math um i'm functional but i'm not great at it i'm not a very mechanical person um I'm not great at a lot of things. In fact, you could fill a book with things that I, that I stink at, but I feel like I'm decent at storytelling. And I feel like if I squandered that, that whatever talent I have, 
I would just feel bad about myself. Um, so in a way, I think probably the best answer, as cheesy as it sounds, is I write because I, I feel like I have to. I write because I don't want to waste what I have. You know, I feel like we go through this once and I darn well want to make it count and I want to make the most of it in, in every regard. And so with regard to my writing, I just want to be the best writer I can be and, and create the best books I can create. And at the end of the day, at the end of my life, I want to look back and know, you know what, you weren't perfect. You know, the, you weren't, you're, this book could have been better or this, you know, this paragraph should have been cut, but you did your best at that time. And I think that, that that's, that's important for me to feel like I've done my best. Perfect. Uh, so these questions have been sent over by uh, our patrons over at www.patreon.com forward slash great writers share. Um, I've only really got time for one or two before we jump into the quick fire round because I want to be respectful of your time. Um, but the first one is what is your top productivity tip or the go-to habit that keeps you on track? Uh, give yourself permission to suck. Um, best advice I've ever heard. I go back to that again and again. I, when I do write, I set myself a goal. It's three or 4,000 words every time I sit down to write. And I try to clear out about three hours to do it. And um, so both by having a goal and then knowing that it's going to be bad a lot of the time, I think that is my key to productivity because then I'm not paralyzed. Then I'm not debilitated by doubt and worry and all this crap um, because that's my natural tendency is to worry. Um, I just remind myself, Jack Ketchum, again, Dallas Mayer, this all is of a piece. It all goes together. Mm-hmm. He said to me when I asked him one time, I said, don't you worry about, you know, you've accomplished so much. Don't you worry about this next book not being good? He said, F, he said the word, F-U-C-K, he said, F fear. And, and, and I, I just kind of blinked at him. He's like, seriously, what has it ever done for you? What is fear? How has that ever helped you? I'm like, oh my gosh, you're right. And so when I sit down to write, I, I, I remind myself of that. I'm like, you know, fear, it's not going to make this book any better. All right. And, and so then I just go and I try to be as courageous as I can. So there we go. Perfect. Uh, what, uh, how do you reward yourself when you've completed a project? Family and I, we go out to dinner, and we uh, so we spend some money. <laughs> we, spend, <laughs> we pig out. Um, I love being with them, and they're happy because I'm happy. And I also, I, I told you about Ryan Lewis and how he taught me or reminds me to celebrate the little things. Mm-hmm. I've always done this, but since I've been working with Ryan, I do it more. When I write something that is good, I will like jump up out of my chair in my office. I'm all alone and I'll pump my fist and I'll, and I'll, and I'll make those, you know, woof sounds and, and, and I will like, you know, flex and, and, and shake my fists and joy and delight and, and whoop and holler. And then my family, they just, they just know that's me. They know I'm a total weirdo. Um, <laughs> I get, I get excited for the little things now. I always have to a degree, but I always kind of try to suppress it. But since working with Ryan, I'm like, why? Why not? Why not get excited? Who cares? Who cares if somebody thinks you're a dork? Who cares if somebody thinks you're a loser? You know, you should be excited. You wrote something decent. You wrote something readable, right? <laughs> so I get pumped about that and I give myself permission, not only to suck, but to be excited when I don't suck. And, and I find that to be so just stimulating and, and, and um, edifying and that, that, that shoves me forward and gives me momentum. Josh Mallerman, one of the best writers alive, he, he's, he talks about momentum. He's a momentum guy. And, and I think he, he approaches it the same way. He gets so excited. Being around him, he's like a human supernova, right? He just emits energy and he feels, he feels courageous enough to be himself and to be excited and to be, to, to be true to himself. And that's also helped me be true to myself and to be excited, to know that that's a good thing. Who cares if people mock you? Who cares if people make fun of you behind your back? They're spending their time making fun of you behind their, behind your back while you're doing something, while you're being excited, while you're living your dreams. All right, let them make fun of you. Let them mock you because that's how they're spending their time and energy. You're spending your time and energy being pumped and amped and excited. And that's a beautiful way to be. See, it's 10 o'clock here in the, in the UK and I'm meant to be going to bed after this, but now I feel like I want to go for a run. Do it, man. <laughs> you go run up Just the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, we're going to finish up now with the quick fire round. So what I've got here is 10 questions. I'm going to throw at you as quickly as possible. Uh, yeah. by, 
<laughs> it's all fun by all means uh, pass if you want to um but we're just gonna plow through them and see how this goes are you ready i'm ready my friend perfect out of all of your own works who's your favorite bad guy that would be uh in my unpublished book ah. it's a woman named marla in a book that I've just completed called Marla. I'm editing it. I'm, I'm almost done editing it and going to start the agent search in a little while because my agent and I parted ways very amicably in uh, September. Um, but I'm going to look for an agent to represent it. I love that character. I despise her, but I love her too. Marla. Yeah. Ultimate way to tease that. Uh, what's your favorite book of all time? That I've written or just in general? Just in general. Uh, Dandelion Wine by Ray Bradbury. I think it's, I call it Love on Page, Love on the Page. Um, it's, it's poetic, it's beautiful, it's just so bursting with love and empathy. It's beautiful. What's the best way to die? Huh. I want to be, as long as it's not traumatic for them, I'd love to be surrounded by loved ones. I'd love it to be peaceful and painless. Um, and, you know, boy, I guess ideally it would be, um, you know, surrounded by my family and my, and, and books too. <laughs> <laughs> so there uh, we what, go. What's your greatest fear? Uh, something happening to one of my children or my wife. Um, something happening to one of those four. That would, I don't, I, 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 I don't know how people move on from that. I don't have, know how people, you know, keep going after that. I just can't imagine something happening to my wife or my kids. Who was the last writer to scare the crap out of you? <laughs> huh. um, I always well, la- uh, love asking this to horror authors. No, that's great. I got to say, I've been reading a lot of good stuff. I'm reading uh, the new Daniel Krauss is really good and it's scary. The, the, his new zombie book, uh, Living Dead, uh, is quite good. Um, the, the last, but I'm not, I'm not done with that one yet. So the one I'm going to say to really shake me up is uh is mallory by josh mallerman um that's his upcoming book that is uh it's just so visceral and the relationships and characters just resonate so and they ring so true um that that one really unnerved me really had me like staying up at night um even after i was done with it not able to sleep yeah what's the worst film of all time shark exorcist my daughter and I, Jewel, she's 12. We just watched it. She wanted to see. We just watched. I, I remembered Creep Show too. I thought it was good. This part with the raft, the Stephen King story. And then we rewatched it. And I hadn't seen it since I was a kid. I'm like, oh my gosh, this really isn't very good. And now I feel bad because now I've shown <laughs> something. And she's like, well, let's find something much worse. I'm like, well, I'm sure we can find something much worse. And so she, and I love Creep Show, the TV show. And I love the original Creep Show, the second one. Not quite as good, in my opinion. Not trying to be mean. I just don't think it's as good as the other two. Uh, but the, the, sh- the show and the movie are great. The first movie and the TV show on Shudder is awesome. But so she, um, we, we, we scrolled through Netflix, Amazon Prime, and she found Shark Exorcist. She's like, Dad, I found it. I'm like, oh, are we seriously going to do this? She said, yeah, let's do it. We watched it. It is, I'm sorry. My apologies to the people who are, maybe you're involved <laughs> in making it. Dan, I hope you're not the screenwriter for it. Uh-huh. Uh, but it, it was so bad. I'm sorry. It was just really bad. And I say that with all affection. Um, you, know, you know, I know they tried, but I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> What's your favorite animal? dogs uh i love all animals i put like a spider on a piece of paper to put it outside i don't kill it um so i love all animals and all living creatures um but dogs and um we have two dogs weasley and l um and i love them both equally because they're my kids but man l she's two she's this tiny little dog and she's the most affectionate creature i've ever met um so yeah i got a soft spot for her what's your favorite word Hmm cheesy answer but it's true is love i think that's i think that's why we're here i think that's that's what it's all about is there a christmas present you wish you got but never received wow these are so good (laughs) um let's see i i usually i usually don't even ask for presents um maybe like i'd like to take a vacation to california to see my just because i haven't been there in a long time i'd like to to meet ryan and then see my sister-in-law out there so yeah I've, I've you know i don't think i've ever wished for that but if anybody out there if you got like you know six grand lying around mm-hmm. and you want to 
budget, you know, to my, my family heading out there. There we go. There's the, the, the now stated Christmas gift. I would love that. <laughs> we'll launch a fundraiser at the end. What's yeah. your favorite time of day? Um, it is, wow. Um, I gotta say it is night and night. I'm a night guy. Yeah. I write in the morning and I love the morning too, but probably night just because I don't know more and more I've felt happy with the way the day has gone, I guess. Beautiful. Uh, and that's 10 questions. I've got one more bonus question for you, which is where can my listeners find out about yourself and everything you're working on? Sure. Uh, I'm very active on Twitter lately, Instagram as well. Jonathan dot Jans on Instagram, Jonathan Jans on Twitter. And, um, also my website, uh, jonathanjans.com. I'm on Goodreads. I think maybe the best way is through my newsletter or one of the best ways is my newsletter shadow world. And you can sign up for that on my um, website, jonathanjans.com to sign up for that. Uh, because I, I try, I don't send it very often, like once every six weeks, but when I do, I try to have quite a bit in there. Mm. Man, well, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Honestly, it's been it's been great chatting. It's always it's always a nice surprise when people are just as genuinely upbeat and delightful as, as yourself. So, thank you so much for sharing this hour with me. You've been awesome, Dan. Thank you so much, and I, I appreciate. It. I feel like I've dominated the conversation. Sorry for talking so much, but <laughs> you were an awesome host with with fantastic questions. So I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for listening. And I will see you next week. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Great Writer Share podcast. Next week, I'll be joined by sci-fi author Jeffrey A. Carver. Don't forget you can get early access to every episode of the Great Writer Share podcast and the chance to ask upcoming guests any of your questions just by becoming a patron of the show. All you need to do is visit www.patreon.com forward slash greatwriterssshare and support the show for as little as $1 a month. One more time, that's www.patreon.com forward slash greatwriterssshare. Until next time.